So dear students, uh, you are welcome in this lecture. And now we are going to discuss the topic, water saving approaches in rice production. How we can save the water in rice production. And we will see how much water is uh, required to produce the rice. We have already covered this topic while we were dealing with the climatic requirement of rice, if you remember. And now just I will refresh uh, your memories that how much water is consumed and required by rice. And it is a huge quantity actually, huge quantity required for rice production. And a lot of questions are asked about the conventional rice culture, particularly from the point of view of water, uh, water use. Water use, you will see how much water is used in rice production. Uh, in yet uh, in another lecture, I will deal with water management in rice. So there I will tell you how much water is used for different purposes in rice. But uh, before I actually start, I want to know from you uh, how water is lost or why there is too much of water requirement by rice plant, or rice crop, and uh, mechanism of water losses from rice. Yeah, what are the mechanism by which water is lost from rice fields? Percolation. Percolation. Evaporation. Evaporate transpiration. Evaporation. Yeah. And sometimes uh, mindless uh, use of water also. Uh, people are not bothered about water. They, if they consider that if it is free, and let us let me apply more water and unnecessarily sometimes people waste water. Now you see the crisis of water is, is around. Uh, if you are from, if you have visited any city, any metro or urban centers, you'll see that people are fighting for water. There is no drinking water even, forget about water for co-production, but here people do not have enough clean and safe drinking water. So these kind of scenes are quite common in, in cities, urban centers, in, not just in India, whole Asia. This is the scene, whether it is Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, any Asian country we have, and not just a scarcity of water, but also pollution of the water is another issue. You can see that this is the situation of our rivers. And uh, these kind of cues, cues um, are there where people are fetching water for their daily requirement. You can see this is not uncommon. People pollute water, rivers, and so on. So, this was just uh, introduction to the water and this is, uh, you know, uh, somebody has said that uh, a next world war will be fought for water and uh, government of India, Ministry of Water Resources is, is having several programs. If you see the public funding or public expenditure on water, it is huge. Uh, expenses are made by the government and uh, several schemes are run by the government so that people get uh, safe and drinking water and water and do not waste the water, clean the water, Ganga action plan, Yamna action plan and so many issues are there related to water. Uh, you see uh, uh, our neighbors, we are not happy with our neighbors like Pakistan, Bangladesh, or China or Nepal. We really have uh, so many disputes on water. Uh, China, China always threat us with water of Brahmaputra. They, sometimes they stop the supply of water when we need, need it most. They do not leave any water for India. And sometimes in flood times, in the rainy season, when we don't require water, they put, excess water in Brahmaputra river and your Assam 
and many parts of India are flooded with water. This is the situation from Nepal also. They are not able to, to retain or to conserve or to stop the water flow into India unnecessarily during the rainy season. Similarly, Pakistan is they ask for more and more water from the rivers. We share many rivers. So some disputes are there uh, between the countries. And within the country also, if you see several river dispute, Kaveri water dispute, Narmada, this and that. So why it is there? Because water is very, very precious. And no life on earth can happen without water. Even the first life on earth came in water, if you know about it. So water is necessary for survival of human or human civilizations. Coming back to our main topic, uh, rice. So water needs of rice are very high. Of course, if I ask you mean water requirement of rice, it is 1250 millimeter. You can remember that value. And as such, you see how much water is consumed by rice to produce one kg of grain. Farmers have to supply two to three times more water in rice field than other cereals. Than other cereals. This is fat known to you. Whether you see the maize or wheat, in maize you need three to four irrigation. In wheat, you need four to five irrigations. But in rice, you need on an average 20 to 25 irrigation. Number of irrigations are more in rice. The water requirement for land preparation is theoretically 150 to 200 millimeter, but can be as high as 690 to 900 millimeter. This is just for puddling. You can say land preparation means puddling. In some countries, puddling is done repeatedly, two times, three times. In India, mostly it is done mostly one time. But in certain countries like Vietnam, it is done for a month. First time they will impound water, they will plow the land, then wait for a few days, then again they will put some water, and then they will go for puddling of the land. So under those conditions, water requirement can be as high as 650 to 900 millimeter. And field water input during crop growth may vary from 500 to 800, this is minimum, up to three meters. So this is, uh, if you remember, I discussed about uh, in detail about water requirement. So I need not to repeat it again, but see very interesting slide. Typical seasonal water outflows and input in lowland rice. So you can see for land preparation, uh, it is 160 to 1560 millimeter, I means 16 centimeter to 150 centi 156 centimeter. This is for land preparation in different Asian countries. <clears throat> and see the losses in evapotranspiration. In wet season, they are less, 400 to 500 millimeter of water in wet season is lost by ET. And in dry season, it is 600 to 700 millimeter by ET and seepage and percolation losses. In heavy clays, they are less, 100 to 500 millimeters. But if you have soils, loamy soils, sandy soils, these losses are 1,500 to 3,000 millimeter. And total seasonal water requirement can vary from 660 to 5,800, 5,280, a wide range. You need not to remember these data, but see the relative uh, losses of water. So the most losses of water uh, occur by seepage and percolation. You can say they can be in loamy or sandy loam soils, they can be 1500 to 3000 millimeter losses by percolation. So this is the major loss. Otherwise, this ET losses are also there. Now you see the amount of water evapotranspiration. If we, if, if we take just E2, ET value, it is equivalent to consumptive use of water to produce one kilogram of major cereals. So you see in C3 crops like rice and wheat, the minimum uh, requirement of water in liters is 625 and 580. See the last column, 980. 980 millimeters, uh, sorry, liters of water is required to produce one kg rice. This is scientific data. And for wheat also, you need just 980, uh, also 980 kilo liters of water to produce one kg wheat. But for maize, it is 625. It is less, much less than wheat and rice to produce uh, uh, one hectare, sorry, one kilogram of grain. 
So in this case, you can say, see that the uh, quantity of water is same for rice and wheat. However, uh, the, since the percolation losses in rice are useless, they, they, they are of no use. So therefore, in wheat, we do not see that much of percolation losses because we don't keep the standing water uh, forever in the, uh, during the growing season. Now see water saving irrigation. So you can see that huge water is required up to 5,280 um, millimeters or on an average 1,250 millimeters. So is it necessary? It is definitely necessary to reduce the water requirement or to reduce the water consumption by the rice crop. So there need to be water saving techniques, particularly water saving irrigation techniques when we apply water to the field. So first option is that reduce the depth of the ponded water. Many times agronomists say that your field should be flooded with water with a depth of five plus minus two centimeter. Means three to eight centimeter standing water should be there in the rice field. It is suggested. So now question come, why to keep eight centimeter ponded water depth? Let us reduce it to two centimeter so that your percolation losses will be less and also evaporation losses can be reduced. So let us, the simple technique is to reduce the depth of standing water, ponded water and increase the frequency of irrigation. Or other option could be even you don't keep any standing water on the surface, you just keep the soil saturated and, and grow the rice. This is second option. Maybe good or bad, we will discuss later, but these are the options of water saving irrig uh, irrigation technique and other is alternate wetting and drying. It has been found a good technique, alternate wetting and drying, which increases nutrient availability, reduces methane emissions, and it reduces the water requirement also. So alternate wetting and drying is also a good uh, approach and without compromising the yield, uh, yield. This alternate wetting and drying is also an option to grow rice. Now, overall, as a student, if somebody asks you, tell me what are the options to save water in rice? What are the water saving approaches in rice production? So as a student, you can answer four, that there are, sir or madam, there are four approaches to save uh, water in rice production. Number one is genetic improvement, or you can say genetic approaches. Number two is crop and soil management. So you can simply say cultural approaches. Cultural approaches are your crop and soil management. Three is water management techniques, or here you can say irrigation, improved irrigation management or water management. Number fourth is your physiological approaches. These are the four important approaches by which we can save water in rice. And almost same can be extended uh, to other crops also. Most of these points uh, you can remember to save water in other crops also. And it is your judgment. In your judgment, you how you answer a particular question. But if you remember these four major approaches, then you can answer for any crop. Now, see the genetic improvement. Selection and breeding approaches, breeding strategies, molecular and biotechnological approach. Selection and breeding strategies are very, very important. Can we find varieties? Can we find varieties of the rice by simple breeding techniques that can be grown under dry conditions or that can be grown un under limited water conditions? So breeders are trying their best, but not much success is there. Only what they do, what they suggest, let us just reduce the duration of the crop. Duration of the crop and grow the crop. But when we reduce the duration of the crop, there is yield penalty. Yield is also reduced. Normally in rice, if you have shorter duration varieties, people try to make rice for uh, 60 days. Pusa Jaldi Dhan, one Pusa Jaldi Dhan, two. These varieties were released long back and they matured just in 60 days. But yield was very low. So uh, this earliness generally associated with lower yields. So not much success in selection, but we can develop drought resistant 
or varieties of varieties which can withstand the drought conditions. Another important point is these days we have climatic changes. Climatic changes, um, for example, there is a, a drought period, drought period, and you have a variety which can tolerate the drought. But suddenly there is a lot of rainfall. Now the same variety which was drought tolerant is having a lot of water. So can this variety tolerate the excess water also? That is the problem. Or initially there may be flooding. A variety is bred for flooding. A lot of water is there, but suddenly after two months, there is drought. So do we have varieties which can tolerate alternate cycles or alternate cycles of droughts and floods? Really we don't have. So these breeders should try or uh, should make varieties which can tolerate drought as well as flood together. So both the characters should uh, require to be transferred to the, to the one plant. Certain uh, breeders are trying to make rice as C4 plant. Just now you have seen that maize can produce more grain with less water. So if we convert this rice into a C4 plant, we will definitely ha have increased water use efficiency. But yet there is no success. Similarly, people are trying to introduce NIF genes, nitrogen fixing genes in rice, so that water use efficiency can be increased. But there is no success. But just for saying, as a student, you can say people are trying some biotechnological approaches to uh, increase the water use efficiency or to uh, for water saving. So you can say either way, water saving or increasing the water use efficiency. Because increased water use efficiency means you are saving the water. Now another is your crop management practices or cultural practices can also improve the water use efficiency or can save the water. Uh, efficient uh, cultural practices like choice of cultivar we just, just discussed. Let us take the variety which has very good root system, which is shorter in duration. And so that under limited water condition, we can grow that variety. Land leveling is most important. I need not to explain it to you. You understand that level field, uh, we, through level field, we can improve the water use efficiency and water saving can be there. Addition of organic matter improves the soil structure, which help in the increase in the water holding capacity of the soil, less leaching, therefore, Organic matter addition can save some water and uh, right date of sowing, rate of uh, seed rate, your varieties, nutrients, uh, weeds, pests, etc. they increase or increase water use efficiency. Even pest management can increase the water use efficiency because if you control the pest, your yield will, will increase with the same quantity of water. So water use efficiency, efficiency increases by management of insect, pests, weeds, etc. <clears throat> so this is one approach that cultural practices or efficient cultural practices can be employed to save water. Number two is saturated soil culture. It was suggested by Borel in 1997. Just keep your land saturated and transplant the crop. And throughout the growing season, you keep your soil saturated. Alternate wetting and drying, this was another approach which also saves water. I will discuss sometimes how this alternate wetting and drying saves water, but it is a water saving approach. Ground water, uh, ground cover rice production system, GCRPS, ground cover rice production system, GCRPS. This system was started in China by Professor Lin. In 2003, they reported what they do, they put a spread a polythene sheet with some holes at a regular interval. As per plant spacing, you can make a hole in the polythene and then spread the polythene in the field and transplant the seedling in the puddle field. So it, this kind of system can save water up to 30% ground cover rice production system. So it is being uh, adopted in China here and there, sporadically. Uh, some farmers have adopted it, but again, not much success you can say. And then system of rice uh, intensification was suggested as a water saving method of rice cultivation. I will discuss today this SRI. This aerobic rice, rice is another method of rice production where water can be saved. I will discuss in subsequent lecture and raised bed.
raised bed is just like any raised bed where seedlings can be transplanted. And this raised bed system is uh, set to uh, increase the water use absence and go for water saving. But this raised bed system is not adopted by the farmer. This remains only research paper and books. So now after genetic improvement, you have seen that crop management uh, approaches, they can also uh, save the water in rice production up to some extent. And in one of them is your system of rice intensification. Other is water management. I will discuss in one lecture, how best we can manage the water in rice production but certain practices like bunding, effective one bunding can save your water, feed leveling, efficient irrigation methods, good irrigation methods are available, precise irrigation, precision irrigation methods are available that can save water in, in rice also now, some people are trying your drip system in direct seeded rice and also a sprinkler system have been tried with success, but they are not in practice because systems are expensive they are beyond the reach of the farmer. Now, latest thing is subsurface irrigation. Now people lay down pipe, drip pipes uh, underground uh, near the root zone, and then they release the water and that is subsurface irrigation system coming up with the modification of uh, your drip system. And mulching can be practiced and other approaches uh, of water management. So effective water management can also save some water and increase the water use absence. The fourth one is your physiological approaches. Seed priming was suggested, means whenever you go for sowing, uh, you, you treat the seed with water. So this is a practice where you can put your seed in water for 24 hours for soaking of a seed and then you plant. So it increases your germination. It saves two, three days time so therefore, it also saves water, maybe little water, but it is known to save some water. Use of osmo protectants. Certain osmo protectants like potassium chloride can be sprayed on the crop to save water. It, it is recommended also in case of sugar cane. Under drought conditions, you can spray 2% potassium chloride. In wheat also under drought conditions, they help in saving the water. And mine 2004 has suggested sufficient silicone nutrition. It also improves water use absence. So overall, you have seen genetic crop and soil management, water management, and physiological approaches. So in crop and soil management, we have seen that method of uh, rice cultivation by SRI and other by aerobic method saves water. So we will discuss that. But before that, I want to show you very interesting table. So what happens, uh, this is quite interesting. There, there is one story about Socrates, it's not Socrates, yeah, Socrates. Socrates was a philosopher from Greece. He was uh, very, uh, I think uh, this Socrates was the teacher of Aristotle, I think. Uh, he was teacher of Aristotle. And Aristotle was teacher of Plato and so on, I think you must be knowing it. So this uh, Socrates, uh, one very beautiful lady came to him and she asked him to marry. But unfortunately, uh, he was not a very smart person. He, he himself found him ugly person. So he said that I'm ugly person and you are beautiful lady, what will happen? So lady actually said that your brain and my beauty will result in good children. But he said, if otherwise happen, if uh, my beauty goes to children and your brain goes to children, then what will happen? <laughs> so similarly, the right thing at right place will yield you good results. So in this case, uh, case if variety is suited for uh, drought condition or less water condition, then it should be used there. If you use it under flooded condition, it will not do better and vice versa. So here you can see this is yield of aerobic and lowland rice cultivars under different moisture regimes at two places in China. Location, you can see there are two places. In, in first place, in, uh, in, you can see flooded throughout rice growth. The varieties were flooded throughout the rice growth, means 
lot of water was there under this condition. So you can see JD305, it gave the best yields, 8.8 .8 tons per hectare, and the HD297 gave 5.4, and HD502 gave 6.8 tons per hectare. Then if 80 to 90% saturation throughout the rice growth, means there was slight reduction in the water supply, 10%, 10 to 20% reduction in the water supply to the crop, then you can see the yield is halved. Yield of JD305, it is reduced. If you reduce 20% water supply, yield has reduced by 50%. It has become about 4.2 for JD305. That means this variety was suitable for flooding conditions. See the next variety. In this case also, there is yield reduction, but less than that. In the second case also, SD502, there is about 1.5 ton yield reduction, but not as much as it was in JD305. And see the last case of rain fed. Rain fed means here water scarcity was great. You had a lot of water scarcity here and only life-saving irrigation was given whenever it was required. So you see in this case, whenever there was very less water supply, in that case, you can say JD305, which was for flooded condition, did not do anything, could not do anything here, just 1.2. But other varieties, HD297 and 502, they have given double or triple yield of this JD305. So here, just I want to give you message that varieties for different situation are different. If you have less water, you need different variety. If you have more water, you need different varieties. Now, coming to the system of rice intensification, SRI, I think many of you might be knowing it. People must have asked you in interviews. So this, this is not new, the system of rice intensification. It came to India in 2003. So this is just 18 year old thing in India, 2003, now we have 22, minus 19 years back, it came to India. So, uh, but now people don't talk much about SRI. So, but as a student, you should have some knowledge about system of rice intensification. Now, first question I want to ask you, uh, why it is called as a system of rice intensification? system of rice intensification. Anybody has any idea? I think you understand meaning of a word intensification. System is okay. System is any, any, any set of things where a particular thing work. That is your system. A set of things, set of principles, set of practices makes a system. And then why it is called system of intensification? Anybody, any guess, your marks will not Sir, be Sir, to, in, uh, to, to intensify the yield of per plant. Per okay. plant yield is more in SRI. That's why it is called rice intensification. Very good. Means he says that. Sir, uh, yeah. Output uh, using same input intensify. Means uh, using constant Same value of input. Per unit is yeah, please repeat, you are coming to the point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there is some problem in your connection. Sir, to get more yield, sir, intensification. Uh, to get more yield, yeah. I mean, just by seeing the, um, the word intensification, uh, it suggests that you will get more yield. Uh, you, you get more yield. But she, the lady was saying something related to input that with the constant input, with the same input. Sir, I said that uh, um, we get more output per unit use of input. This yeah. is called intensification of yield. Exactly, exactly. So the first person was partly right, but she is fully right. So why it is called intensification? Because from every input, we are intensifying the output means there is increase in output per unit of input over the conventional method of rice cultivation. This is the meaning of system of rice intensification. It does not mean that you are increasing the yield 
per plant or you are increasing the yield per hectare, you are increasing the yield or productivity per unit of input. That is the message. I think you got the point. So that is meaning of system of rice intensification. And if it is related to rice crop, then we can say it's system of rice intensification. Otherwise, this intensification word was uh, extended to all other crops in agriculture with different meanings in different crops. For example, in cotton, system of cotton intensification, system of wheat intensification, system of arhar, pigeon pea intensif intensification. People used to relate it to the many crops because it was a very uh, phenomenal, uh, uh, phenomenon, phenomenon to use this system of rice intensification, sugarcane intensification and so on. So it has been extended to many other crops but unfortunately, in most of the crop, we did not get the expected results. But anyway, as a student, you need to learn it. What is SRI, how it is practiced, what are the advantages and what are the limitations? You need to know only this much about SRI. So I will try to explain to you uh, what farmers require. Now I'm giving you views of uh, people who supported SRI because on every topic, uh, if uh, uh, you can have diverse views, you can have different opinions. So for SRI also in the beginning, the people, many people were against SRI and some were in support of SRI and some had no idea. In any case, you can say yes, no, or in, in any case, you, uh, third option could be no, no view. I, I can't say yes, I can't say no. So there can be three kinds of people. Some people supported SRI, some does, do not and some were neutral. So in, in this case, the slide you are seeing, it is by the people who were actively propose, uh, promoting the SRI. What they said, it gives you higher productivity in many countries, not all. So they have reported that if you adopt SRI, it gives you very high productivity. The yields up to the tune of 20,000, 25,000, per hectare have been reported in 2005, 2007, up to 2010. Very high yields of SRI have been reported in the country. One farmer from Madras or Coim to, oh, sorry, uh, Chennai, Chennai area, he, he claimed 25 tons or no, no, sorry. One farmer from Bihar, Bihar, he claimed 22.5 tons per hectare of rice yield. And he was given one award by former chief minister of Tamil Nadu, uh, who is no more, late lady, uh, what was her name? Jailalta, J. Jailalta. Jailalta. Yeah, she gave that farmer award. It was distributed by her hands, that award. So what I mean to say, there are a lot of uh, conflicting results. As a student, uh, you will also not believe, uh, trust, that somebody can produce 20 tons per hectare of rice yield. It is unacceptable at the moment. Uh, I have shown you the limits of high yields also in China, 16 tons that they could reach, 16, 18 tons, but not more than that. That is hybrid rice only. So, but in this case, very high productivity results have been reported in different countries. And they say that reduced cost of cultivation, as uh, recently we discussed, that per unit you can produce more. So definitely your cost of production will be the same, but your result, uh, your uh, output, output will increase or other, other way around also, to get the same output, you can reduce the uh, input. You can reduce the input. So cost of input can be reduced. Reduce water requirement. Uh, you will see how this SRI can reduce the water requirement. Resistance to biotic and abiotic stresses. They claimed that uh, your rice plants or crop will become resistant to biotic and abiotic acid. stresses. Biotic stresses means stress due to weeds or insect pests and disease. Abiotic related to soil or environment or climate, temperature, rainfall, or your salinity, alkalinity, etc. So biotic and abiotic stresses will be less and also particularly when we have climate changes, under those conditions, 
we are going to have more biotic and abiotic stresses where this SRI could prove as a boon. So it was So welcome back again, sorry for the interruption. Uh, so we continue uh, resistance to biotic and abiotic stresses, less adverse environmental impact. This SRA will have less environmental impact because uh, there will not be flooding of water. There will not be any standing water on the field. Therefore, anaerobic conditions will not be there. So less emission of greenhouse gases and less impact on soil or water quality. Improved grain quality. These people claimed that uh, SRA will improve the grain quality. You will have bolder grains, better grains, and uh, healthy grains. Therefore, you will have higher milling percentage and better eating quality. It was proposed by people who promoted SRA. So they said that SRA will do all. So these indirectly, you can see right. that these, these are the advantages of uh, advantages of SRA. Uh, I'll show you other way around also. So overall, they say, said that output uh, raise in output by 50% means your yield will increase at least by 50% or more. And there will be significant reduction in seed requirement. You will see how in SRA seed requirement is less. So there is about 80 to 90% reduction in seed requirement. Water requirement about 50% reduction means up to 50% water saving can be done. Agrochemical use is not required in SRA. And any variety can be grown by SRA method. And cost of production is lowered by 10 to 25%. And farmer's income raises or doubles 1.5 to two times farmer's income. So you can see all goodies are going to happen by adoption of SRI. So these were initial days when SRI came into the picture in the limelight in the world. Just brief history in one line. You can say it was it started in Madagascar. Madagascar is a small island country in Africa continent, somewhere in Africa. Uh, so SRI was developed in Madagascar by father. FR is for father. Handy D. Lolan S.J., his complete, complete name. He was a French priest, French priest who was posted or working in Madagascar and who spent 34 years working with farmers, observing, experimenting, and having also some good luck. So he was just like uh, George Mendel of uh, George Mendel of genetics. Uh, like uh, George Mendel of uh, SRI, but George Mendel of SRI, you can say. So he invented certain principles. While he was a priest, he invented certain principles. And in 1983, he synthesized SRI practices or and principles. And this SRI is spread to uh, China in 1999 in Nanjing Agricultural University, China. And in 2003, it was introduced in uh, India. One, one lady is there from Telangana University, or it, it, is, it was started by Dr. Alapati Satyanarana. Uh, if, if some of you may be knowing his name, he was director extension in 2003, and he introduced it in India. And simultaneously, uh, it was uh, started in Coimbatore also, and uh, uh, there were many people who started SRI, but Andhra Pradesh, then Andhra Pradesh, I think, was the first state to start uh, this uh, SRI. Uh, by 2007, it came to about 22 countries. So overall, what I mean to say here is that sudden, uh, very fast, it is spread to all the rice growing countries in Asia and some in uh, Africa. It did not go to America or other countries because of a small area under rice cultivation. So what are the basic principles of SRA? Why it is different from conventional uh, method of rice culture? You remember I have shown, uh, I discussed with you how to grow rice with conventional method. One is by transplanting, other is by direct seeding. Here in SRA, transplanting is done, but in conventional method also transplanting is done. Then how these two methods are different? 
So there are five points or six points on the basis of which this SRI method is different from conventional rice culture. Number one, very young seedlings are recommended. Here in SRI, you need to grow young seedling of eight to 12 days old, uh, at most 15 days old, means the exit is less than 14 days. Less than 14 days, young seedlings are recommended. And however, in conventional rice culture, uh, mature seedlings are recommended, which have age of three to four weeks. So I will continue this lecture tomorrow. Now the time is going to finish. Uh, and I do not have another link also. And I am tired also. So, uh, but uh, we have two, three minutes time. If you have any quick question, you can ask.